All right. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Wyatt Wegerson. I'm one of the owners here at Bookworks. We are happy to have you on this Sunday afternoon with Nick Estes and Roxanne Dunbar, Dunbar Ortiz um, talking about um, Roxanne's new book, Not a Nation of Immigrants, Sett Settler, Colonialism, White Supremacy, and a History of Erasure and Exclusion. Um, if you would like to uh, interact uh, during, this, um, during this meeting, we have a chat function down at the bottom. You can ask questions uh, during the event or you can wait till Q&A and you can ask Roxanne and Nick your questions. Um, we're, um, Nick Estes is a citizen of the Lower Brule Sioux Tribe. He is an assistant professor in the American Studies Department at the University of New Mexico. He co-founded the Red Nation, a resistance organization um, for 2017 and 18. He is American Democracy Fellow and a Charles Warner Center for Studies of American History at Harvard University. His um, first book, Our History is the Future, uh, Standing Rock versus the Dakota Access Pipeline, The Long Tradition of Indigenous Resistance. If you haven't read it, you should. It's fantastic. Um, and you should get it now in hardcover. It's available next spring in paperback. So you can buy two today, one for you and a friend and make a book club out of it. Um, um, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz is um, <clears throat> the author of Indigenous People's History of the United States and a book called Loaded about guns. Uh, they are fantastic, um, both fantastic reads. If you haven't got them too, you can add it to your reading list. Um, let's see, can we, where is notes? Sorry, Roxanne. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz grew up in rural, or rural Oklahoma, a tenant farmer family. She's been active in the international indigenous movement for more than four decades. She's got a lifelong commitment to the national and international social justice issues. Um, we are very proud to have both of them. If you, um, it, this is just fantastic. I'm gonna turn it over to um, Nick and Roxanne because I'm gonna keep an eye on people coming in so they can enjoy this as well. If you have questions for me or these two, you can please include it in the chat. And um, we celebrate you and um, thank you so much. I'll turn it over. Thanks so much uh, for the introduction. Just a minor correction. Um, I'm no longer at the University of New Mexico. I accepted a faculty position at the University of Minnesota. Um, but no, that's it's totally fine. It's still on, it's still on the website. <laughs> so um, that's, that's my fault. Um, but nonetheless, uh, still much love for the American Studies Department at the University of Minnesota. And I also just want to give an acknowledgement um, that this is a virtual space, but nonetheless, it's being sort of hosted in, in Albuquerque or a place, you know, that is Tiwa territory, um, you know, a very wonderful, you know, rich history of resistance that Roxanne herself has written about. Um, so if you, if you want to learn about the Pueblo resistance and the Pueblo revolt uh, and the history of land tenure, I also recommend uh, reading uh, her book, uh, uh, Roots of Resistance, um, which was, you know, a collaborative book um, that, you know, the, the Pueblos themselves used as a, a kind of foundational text uh, during, um, you know, the, or the, I can't remember if it was the 300 year uh, commemoration of the Pueblo revolt. Um, but nonetheless, um, I think it really gets to some of the heart of the other things that uh, Roxanne talks about in this particular book. And, you know, not a nation of immigrants, um, in my opinion, and my estimation is sort of a, the third book in a trilogy uh, that were mentioned earlier, the first being uh, Indigenous People's History of the United States. The second one was Loaded. Um, and the third one, you know, uh, tackles the question of, uh, you know, the idea of whether or not the United States is a nation of immigrants. Um, but I, what I see these three books really doing in this in this particular kind of framework is trying to understand settler colonialism. 
um, because I, I think uh, Roxanne has uh, beautifully and clearly and cogently documented um, why settler colonialism is not only important to uh, historical analysis and how the United States understands itself, um, not just as a, a kind of domestic nation state or entity, but how it interacts with the rest of the world. Um, and if you have, if you've read those other two books, uh, you know, that's amazing, because I think this one really picks up a lot of the questions that are raised uh, in those two books. Um, but before I get into some questions and discussion about uh, the most recent book, I was wondering if uh, Roxanne could really reflect on this particular moment in time, because it's the day after the 20th anniversary of the so-called longest America's longest war. We've seen President Biden um, you know, signal that he's ending America's longest war by withdrawing from Afghanistan. But as, you know, Roxanne has documented in her book, Indigenous People's History of the United States, um, the longest war is really an extension of uh, America's longer war, I would say, uh, which is the U.S. Indian Wars. Um, and she brought to my attention, uh, you know, the, the military histories of the U.S. of the U.S. Army. Uh, and that it itself uh, acknowledges that, you know, the U.S. war on terror is not necessarily the, its longest war. But in fact, if you look at the battle streamers of the U.S. Army flag, there are 14 battle streamers, I believe, beginning in the 1790s and ending in 1891 with the Wounded Knee Massacre. It's the final uh, campaign streamer, so to speak, of, of the U.S. Indian War. So over a century of warfare. Um, so I was wondering, Roxanne, if you could maybe just give us an analysis of, of this particular moment in time and how it relates to this question of uh, the United States as seeing itself as a nation of immigrants. Um, well, thank, thank you, Nick. And I'm here in San Francisco on the um, unceded territory of the uh, Ohlone people and um, people who experienced uh, really uh, extreme genocide in a very short time by the United States. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, this moment in time, of course, I always wince when I hear this uh, longest war in US history. Um, that's actually kind of laughable. You just take the Seminole Wars from 1815 to 1859. Um, that is one Native nation that the United States was at war with um, in Florida for um, uh, the only thing they ended it was you know the uh, the Civil War actually they never they never defeated the Seminoles they finally just left uh, them in the Everglades they're still there so. Um, this is exactly where the United States uh, developed its uh, militarism, especially all, all of the Indian Wars, taking the continent this over a hundred years to uh, militarily uh, conquer the continent. Um, but the Seminole War in particular is the one that formed the nature of the US Army as a as counterinsurgency, that is um, uh, not in engaging in battles directly. Sometimes that happened, but mainly attacking civilians, uh, burning villages, burning their crops, starving them, forcing them into refugee situations. And every war that the United States um, makes, I mean, make the exception of World War I, World War II, which were, was a very short time in US history, those, those wars, uh, they turn to this counterinsurgency. Um, it's, it's in the, it's simply in the script of the US military. It happens because that generation after generation of military officers, the ones that served in the Seminole War went on the officers, US officers went on to the Mexican war, invasion of Mexico. And then they went on to the civil war. They were all in the same army, the United States army and Robert E. Lee, who was both in the Seminole war and the, uh, the war 
against Mexico was the Southern commander and Ulysses S. Grant, who was in the Mexican war was in the, and that continued on until they wounded me. <laughs> and then they jumped over to the Philippines with the same officers who had been fighting um, your people, the people in the Northern Plains. So this is a serial warfare. I always say there's not a day in US history without war and no one's ever been able to find one for me. I've actually looked, I mean, I've, I've actually tried to find one and I haven't gotten through the every single day <laughs> in my research, but um, there's a war against a foreign enemy going on. And um, even during the civil war, which is considered domestic, they were warring against the, the Dene people, um, incarcerating them, Bosco Redonda, killing Northern Cheyenne at Sand Creek, um, destroying the presence of the Dakota people in Minnesota, all during the Civil War. So those are foreign, those are wars against uh, what the United States considered a foreign enemy. So yeah, this, um, and it is tied up with a nation of immigrants because for one thing, immigrants, um, I should define it first because up until the 1840s, every single European who came to the North American colonies that became the United States, and then those who came after independence up to the 1840s are really categorized as settlers. They came uh, to take land and to, um, to prosper. And uh, they're creating the polity that becomes the United States and then embellish it. And not until the Irish famine refugees came in the 1840s could you call this immigration. They're actually refugees. But in fact, most most people that we call immigrants are actually refugees. We call the Vietnamese immigrants. They came as refugees of US wars, or they come from places that the US has made impossible to live. There's one South Asian uh, immigration scholar, an immigrant himself, who says, we are here because you were there. <laughs> and uh, that really, describes the situation of most um, most people we call immigrants in the United States. Either that or they were um, fleeing pogroms in Europe, uh, the Eastern Europeans fleeing dire poverty in Southern Italy. Um, and uh, they became uh, uh, workers in, in US industry. Uh, so the nation of immigrants uh, concept is a, it's a fairly new, um, uh, it, it, with the civil rights movement and with the, you know, obviously post-World War II, things were going to have to change. So there's an adjustment, as I see it, of the ruling class of <clears throat> this exclusion of cutting off from the rest of the world. The first, um, the first immigration act uh, was in 1874, and it was exclusion, exclusion of the Chinese. The second one was an extension of that, exclusion of all Asians. And then um, in 1923, the exclusion of everyone who was not a Western European, uh, very strict quotas. So almost anyone who came, I mean, other people did come, but they came with, without papers, without uh, legitimacy, contingent, uh, contingent residents, you could say, resident aliens, <laughs> um, they were called. So with, a, um, with the obvious, you know, the competition with the Soviet Union, um, the uh, segregation, Jim Crow still in effect, the Ku Klux Klan marching uh, in the 1950s and the um, um, 
the lockdown, you know, white republic, they had to adjust. So it was John F. Kennedy, a senator, who created the term a nation of immigrants. And it was when he was a senator planning to run for president. And I think it was really in his mind um, a, a, pro, a, a piece of propaganda that um, would rationalize it, an election of a, a child of immigrants rather than old settlers and a Catholic at that in a Protestant country. It had never happened before. Every single president was either an original settler or a descendant of original settlers. Um, so he created this term, a nation of immigrants, published a book that became a bestseller, and it became the, you know, the liberal, um, uh, the liberal uh, concept of um, uh, that is is a myth. But it, it is a myth that everyone believes in all over the world. So it's a very dangerous myth. And I think it's very dangerous for people who come here uh, not knowing what they're getting into, um, that they will be welcomed. And obviously you look at the border and you see, no, you're not welcome. As the vice president said, do not come. And yeah, and that, that raises a lot of questions. And as I, you know, when I first read the, the first iteration of this book, um, one of the things that really stood out to me was, you know, the question of the immigrant and who counts as an immigrant um, and how and what kind of political work it does to reframe the United States as a nation of immigrants uh, and why settler colonialism as a framework is, is so key to understanding or debunk, debunking that particular myth. And one thing that comes to mind, you know, is in the sort of normative framework of immigration, you know, immigrants come to integrate within existing political orders. Um, and this idea of a nation of immigrants almost like ignores or erases that there were pre-existing political orders and that the original sort of uh, colonizers weren't interested in integrating within the existing political orders of indigenous people. Yeah, exactly. They, um, <clears throat> in fact, uh, had the, from very, the very, you know, study 1607 in, in um, Jamestown, they had no intention of living amicably with the uh, the Powhatan people um, who were farmers, who also were were fishers. They had fish, you know, their oyster beds, a, you know, just a rich uh, uh, <clears throat> agricultural and agricultural um, development of. Uh, um, uh, a lot of villages, not just one village, uh, that made up what they came, the, the uh, British settlers called uh, Jamestown. They came with uh, intentions to um, to wipe people out and appropriate. There are already developed um, farms and fisheries. So it's a matter of appropriation. Um, the mythology that gets built, is, and I think is believed um, again by people all over the world, and you know, it's in the um, still in history books uh, that are taught in public schools, that it was a sparse population of native people, and they were nomadic, or they were. Um, uh, what what did they call it? Uh, I can never remember those anthropological terms that are not the case. Um, um, they you know that they sort of roamed around and actually in their own descriptions, you know, in their own do documents, the Anglo settlers described in detail 
the topography, the villages, the farmlands, the oyster beds, the forests. Uh, it's presented by uh, the mid 19th century or the 1840s as wilderness. You know, we still have that that word in the vocabulary, wilderness. And there was no wilderness in the North American continent. Every inch was known, was lived with, but also um, a relationship with. In the East, there were these, these, um, these forests that they created deer parks. That is, they, they created roads. And instead of domesticating animals, they had animals come to the deer park close by and live freely and have plenty of food to eat until they're taken for food. Um, but they're enticed to come. So there was actually very little, oh, the, word, the term is hunting and gathering. <laughs> um, very little of that, no more than, you know, any other part of the world, inclu including Europe. So these things were all described. Um, uh, one, one, uh, uh, one of these uh, observers going out and checking out, out things noted that the, um, the forests were so cleared that uh, an English carriage could easily uh, go from Virginia to, it, it was all called Virginia at the time, but what became the Massachusetts Bay Colony, they were already scoping it out and that uh, a carriage could go all that way on, on the roads that were built. So they appropriated roads, every, almost every highway uh, in the Western hemisphere today are built on um, roads. Uh, native roads. So it was developed. And otherwise, these people would never have survived. You know, I, I, they, it had it been a wilderness, they didn't, you know, they had explored enough for decades, and the Spanish were exploring and also um, uh, publishing uh, records, notes of what uh, they saw. Uh, they didn't bring survival mechanisms that would allow them to survive in a wilderness. So that I think is really important to understand uh, how genocide works and how settler colonialism works because the implication of all of this people wandering around and hunting and gathering in the wilderness is that um, it, it, it's defensible to replace them because they were timed out. You know, they were uh, almost non-human actually. Um, and, you know, it's sad. You might the back that's really sad, but in fact, that's not what happened. <laughs> and it, it's a defense of, it's a um, to obscure settler colonialism and genocide. Yeah, it makes me think of the river landscape that I'm from and, you know, the towns that are on the river, the Missouri River, there may be like two to three thousand people at most, um, but the, the, the civilizations that they replaced had, you know, upwards to 30,000 people in, in like what would be considered urban, you know, sprawls to this day. Uh, actually far outnumbering the, the actual existing settlers that, that live there, um, that currently live there. So I think that that's a really great point. And, you know, one, one, there's two concepts that I kind of want to tease out a little bit that you bring up in this book. Um, the first one is continental imperialism. And that, that's a concept uh, that I believe uh, um, <clears throat> Manu Karuka had uh, uh, sort of created in his book, uh, Empire's Tracks, and looking at the, the transcontinental railroad and Chinese labor and uh, the interactions with indigenous people and settler colonialism. Um, but you take it in a, you kind of expand his concept a bit, uh, the historical framing, which I think is incredibly important. Um, but you look at the beginnings and the origins of this country and, and thinking about specifically 
like the U.S. Constitution. And there's this whole debate about whether or not Indigenous people were talked about in the, in the U.S. Constitution. We hear a lot about the debates around uh, chattel slavery and the, the enslavement of African peoples uh, during during this, you know, during the Constitutional Conventions and the, you know, the, the American Revolution, um, which uh, a friend of ours, Gerald Horn, calls the American Counter Revolution because of its uh, its its um, attempt to maintain a system of chattel slavery when the kind of rest of the world, the rest of the, the continent and the hemisphere was moving away from that. Um, but I think you add a, an important corrective in thinking about how the United States became what, you know, um, what some scholars call the, the fiscal military state at the very beginning in the drafting of the constitution and specifically looking at somebody like Alexander Hamilton who today is sort of glorified and mythologized within the popular musical as being this kind of immigrant, you know, icon. Uh, he came from the Caribbean, um, but serious scholars of history, you know, understand him as a slaveholder. Uh, on one hand, you know, it's widely accepted, but what's also not really quite understood is that he was very military minded in his understanding of creating this white settler republic, uh, specifically creating a strong military to annihilate indigenous people. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Alexander Hamilton was uh, key to um, the, the structure of the, what would be the new state and uh, what the purpose was. He, I, he probably understood more clearly um, the, the goals that you know Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, what they all dreamed of. I mean, they wrote about it incessantly. Um, that they wanted to get to China. They wanted to have Chinese trade. They wanted to get to the Pacific, and they drew up maps uh, in what's called the Northwest Ordinance, which was during the Continental Congress but it was later enveloped into uh, the constitution itself. And in the Northwest Ordinance, they had uh, rough maps of, um, uh, of, of the continent and, and how to get there. In fact, they named places on the West Coast on those maps um, after the colonies themselves. Uh, they, um, they wanted to um, uh, have this trade with China because China was the main source of uh, providing um, uh, uh, commodities to the rest of the world, useful commodities. And it was an imbalance of trade. So this was a dream of European imperialism when it started. And it, you know, it, these were European imperialists that founded the United States. Uh, they were not different from their brethren. They only rebelled for independence because the monarch, um, they kept saying it, you know, they made it very clear in the Declaration of Independence why, um, was restraining them from expanding so they could get to the Pacific. Um, they, um, they were limited uh, after the French and Indian War, as it's called in North America, it's a seven year war in Europe between France and Britain over North American territory. And the Britain won, but they didn't want to have uh, the, to extend settlements as such. Uh, they would continue fur trading. The French also uh, continued fur trading, um, but they didn't, and they had so, a few forts, but mainly forts uh, supplying the fur trade. It was the biggest industry at the time in the world, uh, very lucrative, killing all the beaver in North America and many other creatures. <laughs> and then they got to the buffalo and killed all them. Um, so this, the, this was in Britain's interest. They had no interest in these colonists expanding because the fur trade was good enough for them. 
uh, for commodities. And then the plantation agriculture, of course, what was being produced uh, by slave labor, uh, the cotton and the, and the tobacco was the major commodity. Uh, and so they, they drew a proclamation line beyond which uh, British settlers were not to go beyond into or beyond the Appalachian mountain chain, the Allegheny mountain chain, all the way up into Canada down, um, they were not to go. And any that have gone there, and many had gone and were, um, were burning native villages and taking them. Uh, these were farmers also on the other side in the Ohio Valley. Uh, they were to be brought back. So they actually um, had, you know, the, the colonial militias and uh, the state, the colonial militias and the uh, redcoats um, going in and bringing people back out of there. Uh, because they were creating wars with, with the, the native people. Uh, the thing was that these founders were very invested in that area. It really started with, in the early 1700s, that they started going over and um, uh, surveying. They were basically, they were surveying the land, that's why George Washington's called the surveyor. Something I couldn't quite uh, understand when I was growing up because I had a cousin who was a surveyor and it was such a humble job. I mean, it's a working class job, tromping around in the mud and uh, surveying, you know, for a company. And I couldn't figure out why this man dressed, you know, with all his finery and plumes and, and, uh, uh, why, how he possibly could have been a surveyor. But of course he didn't himself did it. He took the militias in and uh, they surveyed and then they sold, they sold deeds that they had no control over whatsoever. They didn't own, they just surveyed and then sold these deeds to other settlers. And so they had huge investments in these deeds and that was a major reason why they, to become independent was their financial self-interest, but also to expand further and also to make those deeds good, you know? So, uh, so they would get settlers into that territory. So the Northwest Territory outlined, you know, exactly how it's the, um, it may exist in some other settler states like New Zealand or Australia or Argentina, um, probably the apartheid state, definitely because they copied in Israel, they, they copied the US settler state. Um, but this document, the Northwest Territory actually lays out um, how to get to the Pacific with these maps, but also uh, commodifying the land uh, creating these 160 acre, uh, 160 acre uh, plots, these rectangles uh, that they had mapped already, uh, paying no attention to, you know, rivers and streams and mountains. It was simply as if it were flat, and then these these pieces of land could be sold. So real estate became. Uh, the basis for U.S. capitalism at its founding, uh, the fiscal military state was invested in uh, the bodies of, of enslaved Africans were commodi commodities, a uh, major commodity by 1840. Um, black bodies made up asset, uh, that asset was greater the cumulative asset was greater than all other assets in the United States put together at the time. And the United States had the largest GDP in the world by then, it was all the cotton kingdom. So <clears throat> real estate is still, you know, is still the main factor of, of um, uh, the US capitalist economy. 
But the United States was really founded as a corporation, basically. I mean, it's, it's just a large corporation that creates other corporations or allows the states to do it. And Alexander Hamilton was, well, uh, let's deal with it being an immigrant. This is, you know, this is the, of course, the Hamilton, the musical. He's an immigrant, he's a bastard, he's a, um, uh, he's poor, ragged, you know, barefoot practically, um, who, who is, you know, the, makes it in, um, as an immigrant. And there's one line in the musical of Lafayette and, and uh, Hamilton uh, yelling, uh, immigrants, we, uh, we get the work done. And of course, Lafayette was a royal, you know, a, a royal member of the royalty and an adventurer and had no intention of ever staying in the United States as a, for any reason. But Hamilton came from the Caribbean and uh, the Caribbean was like 1% um, of the population were Europeans. It was, these were the slave colonies and every single white person was privileged just by nature, not being enslaved. It didn't matter, you know, if, if they were an orphan, they were taken in. He, he was taken in, trained as an accountant in a you know in a business that what did they trade there was nothing to trade except the slave trade and and the things that go along with that you know the seasoning the you know, the books uh, he was taught to keep the books for the trade but this is of course never uh hardly ever i i don't know you know this is this is so well known it's not like it's some secret of history uh, but since most U.S. people know nothing about Caribbean slavery, uh, they don't guess at it. Uh, why should they? Um, so when he moved, when, or when he was sent by his benefactors to go to Columbia College, as it was called then, uh, it was called, well, it was called, it was called something else. They, they named it Columbia. But anyway, it was Columbia. It was still Britain, you know, it was before the revolution. He came, he didn't really come as a settler, he came as a student. Uh, it would be like you, you know, gr growing up in South Dakota, going to New Mexico to get your degree, that you wouldn't be an immigrant to New Mexico, no one would call you an immigrant. Um, so no one would think of, they didn't even have that word, you know, in their vocabulary. So he he was not really a settler either, but he immediately quickly married into the wealthiest family in New York that descended from the old Dutch slave owners, the Shilers. And uh, they were big slave traders, also owned slaves, uh, but they were involved in the transatlantic slave trade as well. So that he he kept the books, the Shilers, and he he personally owned owned slaves. Uh, so his, but he was a brilliant um, a capitalist inventor. I I'm really sorry that um, Karl Marx and uh, Engels never discovered Hamilton because he would have been such a good case study for them to understand the origins of capitalism, um, you know, put into a state, uh, incorporated into the first uh, republic in the world, being, uh, you know, a capitalist state. And this term fiscal military is a term that means a state built for war. And I would add, you know, a capitalist state built for war. So the militarism built in and Hamilton's role, he was, you know, Washington's army was really Hamilton's army. He's the one that took 20,000 troops in to put down the um, uprising the, uh, uh, of the, uh, uh, the tax, uh, the tax on, on uh, cider. 
into uh, into eastern Pennsylvania. Um, he was he was the he was the military strategist for the whole thing, but he was also the banker, and he was also um, uh, the the creator. You know the the main. Um, creator the constitution they always say the federalists but it was it was really um hamilton that understood um understood how to um prevent democracy we see it playing out now and people see it as as uh, flaws in the constitution or maybe something that you know, that the founders must, this is what liberals say, the founders must have wanted their future people to, you know, they quote John, Thomas Jefferson, that there should be a revolution every generation, new constitution. And of course he, um, he, ha he had no uh, intention of that, certainly didn't lead it in himself, uh, encourage it. But actually, it was meant to never be changed. It was meant to make it almost impossible to change. And there's no other constitution in the world like it. There's no other country that keeps the same constitution forever. They, you know, in Bolivia, um, the Evo Morales, uh, no one, they may have objected to what was in that constitution, but not having a new constitution. I think it was about the seventh one Bolivia had had, France has had five, Britain barely has one at all. And actually quite a few countries don't have constitution. So it's not a necessary, necessary to have a, you know, a government to have a constitution. Native nations uh, could, you know, if they want write constitutions, but they haven't. Um, so it's, it's, it's just, you know, it's just a framework, um, that can be changed, but not the U.S. Constitution. And that was intentional. The Electoral College was intentional. The filibuster later was intentional. Um, it's not meant to be changed. And so the whole idea of, um, a democracy First of all, it's kind of flawed because it comes from, you know, idealizing uh, 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 Greeks, ancient Greek society, which, you know, was not a democracy at all. It was a rich white male, you know, pretty much like in the United States. Um, so the only democracy around was, you know, weren't um, like the Haudenosaunee and, and native nations, you know, having actual participation of uh, people in, uh, in the affairs of, uh, of uh, the nation. And um, sometimes having, I've, I've read about the um, Cherokees, uh, uh, the US negotiators getting so annoyed with the Cherokees when they would have, uh, they had mass meetings uh, so would last years and years and years uh, to consider, you know, what, uh, so they, they became impatient, simply invaded and took what they wanted <laughs> with Andrew Jackson and stopped negotiating. Uh, so the, I think we have to understand that we will never be able to change this country without getting rid of the U.S. Constitution. Um, because it's impossible to actually uh, revise it. Uh, it takes what three fourths of um, the Congress uh, of the states, uh, a majority of the Congress, first of all, and then three fourths of the states have to approve any amendment. So it's um, it's the main barrier. You know, it's the main barrier. It also. Um, features prominently and the people who who fetishize it, the Second Amendment, uh, know what they're talking about, know what it was intended for. You, you'll notice that they're mostly uh, white men and pretty racist. So it's embedded in racism and Indian killing militias, citizens militias. 
and the well-regulated part of it, these citizens, these settlers were very well-regulated because they were taking land and that's what they wanted. And they are self-regulated. The United States takes all this pride in, you know, self-regulation. And that's, uh, and yet they said, well, this must have been a government thing, the National Guard. But the Constitution has the National Guard provided for in Article 8. They don't need the Second Amendment for it. So this, you know, Alexander Hamilton wasn't the sole author, but all the key points that would create this fiscal military state, he had, he definitely was the, um, the architect. He also created the first corporation. And it was in Western Massachusetts, the Springfield Armory to make guns. <laughs> so his militarism and his, um, it's interesting, he died by the gun, um, fittingly. But yeah, I, um, I think it's really, you know, I made it the first chapter because um, it all ties together, you know, Hamilton the musical became the reason I decided to write this book um, because it, it just cried for some kind of truth intervention. <laughs> there's, um, yeah, there's, there's so much there um, and we're kind of running out of time, but I do want to like summarize a little bit of, of what you said and thinking, and I'm glad you brought up the question of uh, liberal democracy and specifically this the U.S. Constitution, and you call it in in other in another book, uh, U.S. Uh, or people's history, Indigenous people's history of the United States, the cult of the covenant, as if it's this you know trans historical document um, that exists throughout time. It's not you know it kind of just appears out of nowhere. And, you know it's almost as if it's uh, preordained by God in some ways and and you bring up some other examples as if as if there can never be an alternative to it as well and i'm glad you brought up you know countries uh, like bolivia that has a plurinational constitution that isn't based uh, that doesn't privilege the individual rights of of people uh, because we know that individuals aren't equal in a class-based society as you pointed out so uh, so poignantly but also that their collective rights. So in other countries, like I'm thinking of like Honduras, like why was Berta Caceres assassinated? Uh, she wasn't assassinated just because she opposed a dam, but she represented a political project in alliance with the Garofunas of Honduras, the, the, uh, this, the Afro descendants or Afro indigenous people on the coastline to create and to push for a plurinational constitution which, you know, threatens, you know, U.S. Uh, interests in that particular area, because who are the most dispossessed? It's indigenous people like Beta Caceres uh, and Garfuna people who are making an important alliance, not only to uh, protect the environment or nature, but also to establish a new political order. Um, and I think that's it gets to the sort of geopolitics of this idea of a nation of immigrants, uh, as you mentioned before, uh, you know, we are here because you were there uh, as the, the, the South Asian scholar um, uh, that you quoted earlier had said or had written, um, but it gets to this other idea that the United States' place is not because it, it just hates people based on race, um, but there's often an economic factor that ties into it or that like, why invade Vietnam? You know, what natural resources did Vietnam have? You know, it wasn't kind of a vulgar taking of, of resources or extraction. It was because this small country represented a political and economic alternative to U.S. capitalism or Western capitalism. And I think that's an incredibly important thing to, to point out that it's, it's also the same way with Indian killing. Yeah, it was just it was about taking the land. Um, it, you know, but it wasn't based on just a hatred for culture, language, religion, or race. Um, and it wasn't just about taking the land, but it was also because indigenous people, especially uh, at, in 1776, had powerful confederacies. They represented a political alternative to the United States. So I, I'm really uh, 
happy you brought that up because it it, it grounds the conversation of the book in a settler his, uh, settler colonial context. And thinking about this as not just a quote unquote domestic problem of immigration, but one of geopolitics, specifically US imperialism. <laughs> exactly. Um, do you want to, um, do we, how much time do we have left? Um, I didn't know if we wanted to take some questions from the audience, maybe like one or two. There's one that really sticks out. I can't see the Are chat. Are you there, on Wyatt? Screen. You wanna have you read the question? So yeah, I um, I've been following the chat. Uh, thank you, everybody participating in the chat conversation. Um, just as a follow, we are okay on time. Um, we yep. can keep uh, keep going and have some questions. Um, let's see. Um, do does let's see does someone have a question if they want to raise their hand or they want to mute themselves they can ask a question and we can do it that way there is a question in the in the chat i can go scroll back up and read it um, uh, or uh comment. For Glenn mitchell's question mm -hmm. Does Glenn Mitchell want to ask the question? Is that what's more Sure, important? I can read it if you like. Uh, yeah. And there's been a couple of fantastic responses already. But my question was, uh, there's a version of history that is maybe more of a middle ground, for lack of a better term, a story that presents the U.S. in terms of some dynamic tension between imperialistic militarism and enlightened freedom. It's a story that attempts to span the breadth from genocide and enslavement to freedom and equality in some long arc of a nation striving towards morality. My question is, is this story equally as mythological and self-serving as the nation of immigrants story, which it seems so to me, or is there some historical truth about this nation bending towards justice that is of value and worth preserving? Well, I don't think as a historian myself, I've ever detected a, um, a truly government-led bending toward justice. I think that, you know, as Howard Zinn's book uh, documents and, and many others, but he was really the first to um, Pose that you know that that resistance is the only thing. Slave insurrections that uh, were becoming more and more successful, plus the marooning with the Seminoles having a uh, a place to to go and survive and then fight as well. Um, so. Yes, I think those resistance movements and more than anything, native resistance um, in the 19th century and, and continuing you know, today, the fact of holding on to at least uh, remnants of original land bases and insisting on uh, regaining land that was taken without treaties, without legitimate treaties, and often without treaties at all with the national parks and almost everything that's called federal land now. I think that's the most important arc toward freedom and justice in the United States is that native struggle to retake the land and, and have a uh, voice far beyond the population numbers uh, in terms of, you know, especially the, uh, the catastrophe we're facing with um, climate, uh, the climate that um, capitalism has destroyed. Um, so, but I don't think that comes from anything related 
to settler colonialism or the constitution or government action. Why there's also somebody with their hand raised. Um, I don't know if you can see that on the screen. Um, and I'm unmute them. Yeah. Do you, do you see them? Can they unmute themselves? Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we did answer this a little bit with the last question, but like, um, there's a, a big connection between, you know, you know, I, I've read or, or heard that 80% uh, of all biodiversity is, is protected by indigenous people. So how crucial do you think, um, you know, indigenous stewardship or land back is to um, combating the, the climate crisis, which is a product ultimately of capitalism and colonialism? You want to take that, Nick? Sure, that's an excellent question. Yeah. <laughs> and it gets, it gets back to, um, the conversation that uh, Roxanne had brought up and I sort of mentioned in my comments and in response to her, her answer, like the, the, the Bolivian constitution, which I think is an incredibly revolutionary document. Um, Bolivia itself, you know, is about 60% of indigenous people, uh, perhaps more, um, but within their, their rewrite in the, the early 2000s, um, they included the rights of nature, um, which is, it, it's not some, it, it's been adopted in different contexts, but I think the way that it was uh, theorized and expounded upon in uh, the Bolivian constitution came specifically from indigenous perspectives and worldviews about uh, humans as not humans and nature, but humans as part of nature and societies as part of nature. Um, and their specific model, like the, 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 the social movements that brought it together was, you know, it was called the movement towards socialism. So it was thinking specifically with an anti-capitalist uh, framework and being led by indigenous people, people such as Evo Morales uh, and, and many others, many from trade unions. Um, the problem I see with that framework kind of moving outside of the Bolivian context is that you apply it to, you know, it's been used by indigenous movements in, in other places and to a relative degree of success. I was just, I'm, I just came back from the line three kind of frontline camps uh, and the, the, the um, kind of legal strategy right now with uh, the wider uh, uh, nation, Anishinaabe nation is that they're trying to get the rights of Monomen uh, recognize Monomen is their wild rice, which is, it's not just some kind of abstract relation that they have to this particular, um, uh, this particular grain, but it's literally their entire livelihoods. I sat in a, a dried up rice baddie um, just two days ago with their tribal historic preservation officer. Um, there was a massive drought. And so what does that mean? It means people are out of, of, of a season. They're out of jobs. Um, they're not getting hired to work on the pipeline, you know, um, but climate change has affected their ability to reproduce themselves on their own land and to live, you know, in relation or, or with nature uh, in that particular way. Um, so I don't think, you know, um, you know, it's, it's some kind of, you know, granting this unique, you know, oh, nature is, is, is one and unto itself, but it's understanding what Roxanne brought up earlier um, about these intrinsic relations with, with the land itself, not in some kind of, you know, we were running around frolicking in the woods, you know, being hunting gatherers and not taking showers or whatever. Um, but it was, it was uh, because our livelihood depended on it. And there's a reason why like our nation, much like the white earth nation has uh, the, the wild rice written into their treaties. We have the Buffalo written into our treaties because it was our life ways. It was our, it was our livelihoods. It, yeah, sure. There was a cultural and spiritual connection, but it was more than that. It was material. Um, and I think where the rights of nature movement is going, and we have to look to Bolivia as an example, because that's where it started is understanding that it's like the, the United States is spending, you know, almost a trillion dollars a year on weapons of war. Um, and it's doing nothing 
to take the, the, the wealth that is accumulated at the expense of the rest of the world and the immense amount of emissions that it's put into the atmosphere at the, at the expense of the rest of the world and putting anything good into, you know, in terms of like protecting these landscapes. So I would say that indigenous people, yes, are absolutely on the forefront um, of environmental protection and, and rights in that sense, but they're not token. There's, you know, even in the United States and Canada, there was a recent report that came out through the Indigenous Environmental Network that says that indigenous movements are challenging infrastructure, uh, carbon infrastructure and extraction projects in Canada and the United States that account for a quarter of these countries' emissions, carbon emissions. And we're like less than 1% of the population in the United States. So that is an incredible you know, um, impact that we're having just in our ability to organize. And I think, you know, just to go back to Roxanne's book and her main point, it's uh, it's to say that, yeah, we are the alternative in one in one aspect, you know, in one respect, but it also requires um, a lot of support, you know, and, and, and attention given to the structure called settler colonialism to understand why we haven't had the kind of things, the kind of revolutions or the kind of social movements in other parts of the world that are really leading the way. Um, we're so far behind in terms of where we should be. And um, on that note, um, what you said did remind me of a, of a quote I heard from, I think it was Carl Sagan, he did say that, you know, people are just still dealing with the conceit that they are separate from nature, and that our needs are separate from the needs of nature. And, you know, to tie back to what you said, you know, the, the noble savage trope is employed a lot that, you know, people did were lived up harmoniously with nature because they were, you know, not human. But it was that's not so much that so much as, you know, understanding that if your needs come from nature that you have to protect it and preserve it. Yeah, that's that's the thing. There's this uh, idea of the noble savage and then, the, of course, the ignoble savage. Um, and the noble savage um, construct is almost as destructive because it does, um, you know, it does create a, a, a future that no one can imagine living in and because no one ever really has lived in that you know state of um, utter wilderness um, every you know the there's the I used to be told by the um, elders of of uh, Nick's country that um, that there you know this relationship with other with plants I mean not just animals not just mammals but every living thing that it's a um, that human beings I think this is one of our problems actually is that we think human beings are no damn good and I did you know I had that attitude there's just something defective about human beings maybe and a lot of extreme ecologists especially in the 1980s were saying it's fine you know let uh, let uh, people be wiped out by you know plagues or or climate catastrophe because uh, earth will be better off without them and and what i i learned was that we actually do have a role or we wouldn't be here you know that we have to find that and uh, I think Native people were doing that. The way they re-sculpted, uh, read, um, uh, what's his name, Man, uh, what's his first name? Man's book. Charles Mann. Yeah, Charles Mann, 1491, the science writer. Uh, I think he puts it all together, the Western Hemisphere, better than anyone else. What that hemisphere was like in 1491 before the Europeans came. And it was, it, it was human beings living in concert with all of nature and all the creatures of nature, but also making it better actually for all life, not just human life. Uh, so that knowledge is sort of built into all native cultures. Um, they've been so harmed, damaged by colonialism and genocide 
that it is is often very hard to put it together. Uh, but I think we've seen in the last uh, 50 years, especially the last half century of struggles, a lot of that being re, and a lot of it's in the languages that were many of them also wiped out that that the concepts that are built into the languages are extremely important. So language revival seems like a, a luxury, you know, well, why, why do you need to do that? You know, you, no one, so few people who speak, uh, uh, speak the, the language, why it's not practical, but it's actually necessary for, for rebuilding these concepts. I think someone has a hand up there. Oh, I think that, I think that, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> is this a question? Add, you know, take it down. Um, I think you see that with concepts, like, you know, concepts of, you know, where people would purposely start um, controlled fires in um, forests to clear out dead brush, because if, if dead brush accumulates and accumulates, it can start like an even bigger fire. Or, you know, a concept of agriculture, and that can, that even improves life for, animals, other animals in the forest, among other things. Uh, that's all I have to say. Well, thank you. Well, thank everyone. Thank uh, Bookworks and thank you so much, Nick. For Do you want to, I want to say one thing before you, uh, we close up, Roxanne. Uh, we barely scratched the surface of the book. <laughs> there are so many other things that we could have talked about, so many other angles that we could have gone. And so I just really recommend people, if this, you know, somewhat piqued your interest and you haven't read the book, uh, you should definitely pick it up. It's, we've, we've only covered, I would say, maybe not even 5% of what's in there <laughs> and the topics. Um, so it's a wonderful book, uh, very accessible, um, read it and share it with folks. Um, it really changed my perspective on a lot of things and even thinking uh, of settler colonialism kind of beyond the framework um, that we're, we're taught to even when we do study settler colonialism. So it's such a necessary addition uh, to um, the scholarship uh, and the activism. So I just want to thank you, Roxanne, for, for writing this and uh, gifting this to us um, all. So I really appreciate your work um, and the time and the care that you've taken in, in not just this book, but the others that have come before it. Well, thank you, Nick. And everyone should read Nick's book for going more deeply into some of the things we've, we've talked about here at the end that um, uh, our, his, uh, our past, if we, What's the name of the book? The history is our path, our, our present. Our history is the future. <laughs> our history is the future. Anyway, that, um, that book is, uh, you will really uh, learn, uh, you know, much more than, than is in my book because I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't know things like that that Nick knows. So buy both books, buy them from Bookworks, order them from Bookworks, support. Uh, you know, independent bookstores, and especially the wonderful bookworks in Albuquerque. Is our owner there? I think Wyatt's on mute. Oh, there he is. Wyatt. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We really appreciate it. Does anybody else, if you want to unmute yourself and just uh, give a round of applause for these two for coming and having a discussion. Um, it, this was fantastic. I did. Thank you. Okay. Hey, Roxanne. Thanks, Nick. This was great. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate this. I learned a lot. I have read your first book, uh, uh, Indigenous People's History of the United States, and I will read your next book. Thank Not you. an Have a good day. Thank you.